Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. This is the 17th webinar that Pallium is hosting on topics relevant to healthcare teams who are actively leading the response to COVID-19. These webinars are made possible thanks to an unrestricted contribution from Beringer Ingelheim and their Bridging Hope Initiative. We're very appreciative to them for their support. And today's webinar is entitled Shortage of Palliative Care Medications During COVID-19. And this is the second such webinar on this topic. So we're very interested to be listening to today's uh, subject matter experts, of which there are several, and they will be introducing themselves in just a bit, and, and each will be taking us through a series of slides and engaging in dialogue. Next slide. Um, before we get into this uh, webinar, I wanted to introduce um, a relatively new initiative, uh, what we're calling the Canadian Palliative Care Exchange. And really the, the enthusiastic response uh, that we've received by healthcare professionals to these COVID related webinar series has prompted uh, what is really an exciting partnership between Pallium and the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians. And with support from the Canadian Medical Association, Scotiabank and MD Financial Management, the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians and Pallium have launched a moderated online community of practice, what we're again calling the Canadian Palliative Care Exchange. And the exchange supports um, interactive online uh, national dialogue between healthcare professionals right across the country regarding the most relevant COVID related topics in palliative care. Um, the exchange is, is a professional learning site. It's moderated by members of the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians and it's open to all healthcare professionals, including physicians, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, and there's no cost to participate. So uh, I would encourage all of you uh, when the webinar is over to, to join the exchange. Uh, you go to www.cpcexchange.ca, uh, ask your questions about palliative care, um, share your experiences, and, and teach and learn with colleagues right across the country. Thank you for that. On to slide three regarding some housekeeping. Uh, in terms of our housekeeping items, uh, all of your microphones have been muted. It doesn't mean that we don't wanna hear from you though. Uh, we would like to solicit your input and questions throughout the webinar, which you can do by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So throughout the webinar, our panelists will be answering the questions that are raised and our moderator, Dr. Chen, will be bringing some of these forward to the panel for further discussion. So I, I really do encourage all of you to ask your questions, uh, post your comments, um, add to the collective knowledge that will be generated over the next 60 minutes and thank you in advance for doing so. We also wanna ask that in order to respect privacy and confidentiality, you refrain from sharing any specific details on cases or particular situations when posting your questions and comments, and we appreciate that. And we'll be collecting and collating all of this input for future reference. Uh, the session is being recorded. It's going to be available on Pallium website in about a day or so. Slide four. Uh, so again, I'm your host for today's webinar. My name is Jeff Mote. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada. And I'm going to let each of the presenters introduce themselves. And we'll start with Dr. Charlie Chen. Uh, over to you, Charlie. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, so I am a palliative care consultant and the medical director for the palliative end of life care program here in Calgary Zone, Alberta Health Services. Um, I am a scientific and consultant with Pallium. So that's the one piece of declaration I need to make that I do occasionally receive honoraria from Palliative Canada. It's my pleasure to be moderating today. Hi everyone, I'm Ebri Kaya. I'm also a consultant in palliative medicine. I work in Toronto, Toronto General Hospital. I'm the site lead there for our clinical program. And I'm also on the board of the CSPCP and together with Kim Taylor, I lead the uh, re representation on drug shortages for CSPCP. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Bob Sauls and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon. Uh, I'm a palliative care physician from Mississauga, Ontario, just outside of Toronto. And currently I'm the provincial clinical co-lead interim uh, for the Ontario uh, Palliative Care Network. And my, my only declaration is that I do receive a stipend uh, from the Ontario Palliative Care Network for the work I do uh, uh, in that role. Uh, hello, my name is Marcus von Krozik. I am a clinical pharmacist working at uh, Vancouver Center at BC Cancer. Uh, as part of my duties, I work in our pain and symptom clinic um, uh, involved in that aspect in palliative care. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, moderator and panelists. Uh, in terms of declarations of conflict, uh, 
Pallium is a national nonprofit organization. Uh, we were founded in 2000. We're based in Ottawa. We're funded in part by Health Canada, and we equip healthcare professionals, healthcare organizations, and communities with the skills and knowledge to provide palliative care earlier, more effectively, and more compassionately to all Canadians. Uh, in terms of conflict, I am an employee of Pallium Canada, and I don't believe any of the presenters have any conflicts to declare, uh, but I'll open that up in case there is. Okay, over to slide seven. Um, in terms of the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians, uh, of which uh, we are partnering with on today's webinar, and as I mentioned earlier on the Palliative Care Exchange, uh, the CSPCP is a nonprofit organization funded primarily by membership dues and, and annual conference. Uh, it's a community practice uh, offered jointly with ourselves, I mentioned, um, the Canadian Palliative Care Exchange, and it's supported by the CMA and Scotiabank and MD Financial Management. Uh, and I'll leave it there and I'll pass it over to Charlie who'll kick us off with our objectives. Charlie. Thanks again, Jeff, for that warm welcome. Um, so upon completion of this webinar, we hope that you will be able to identify resources for identifying current and pending shortages uh, of medications related to palliative care, recognize conservation strategies at a local, provincial and national level, and understanding pharmacy regulations that are impacting care and now I'm going to hand it over to Ebru, who's going to be our first presenter. Thanks, Charlie. Um, chances are, if like me, you've, you may have already encountered some drug shortages in the past, particularly this spring, and you might be worried about an increase in demand in the fall, uh, particularly as physical distancing measures are relaxed and potentially COVID cases increase. We seem to have a bit of a breathing space right now though, so we thought that now would be a great time to, to, get, this, to get together to discuss the topic and, and really hopefully be prepared if we're faced with this reality. Next slide, Stephanie. So we've tried to split the webinar into a format that's easy to separate so that if you do decide to go back um, sometime later in the year for a Hopefully we'll be able to show you, um, give you some ideas on how you can get involved and support national and regional efforts to assist with measures to maintain drug availability. And we'll give you some ideas on best practices for system level approaches that you could implement, as well as some ideas for how to maintain your up-to-date knowledge on drug shortages, particularly in your area. Next slide. You know, when we look at the bigger picture in Canada as a country, it's clear that palliative care drugs are a really small component or small scale compared to other drugs. And we've already had shortages in the recent past and therefore, you know, our palliative care drugs are particularly susceptible to anything that puts an increase on the demand for our drugs, such as the current pandemic. So, you know, small volumes are typically manufactured by the companies that, that manufacture the drugs that we use. On top of that, many of the drugs that we use are the same as those that are used for COVID patients by other teams. And there aren't any significant reserves of stock due to the current way that the pharmaceutical industry is designed or, or modeled. On top of everything, the way that the pandemic played out um, manufacturers and purchasers alike, alike has, have had significant difficulty in trying to predict future demand and make adjustments to their purchasing patterns. And really, at the start of the pandemic, I think our palliative care community, we were aware of many of these issues. However, whilst some of the issues were known to the wider medical community, I think many of them were not. Next slide. So it was clear in, by April, by the middle of April, that we had significant problems across the country with regard to, to certain drugs, particularly within our community teams. These teams, which often use small independent suppliers and distributors who wouldn't necessarily have access or direct contact with manufacturers to be able to um, reassign supply and allocation depending on what's happening with demand. But we were lucky Health Canada got the ball rolling quickly and we were linked with the Drug Shortages Unit, 
which formed a tier assignment committee on palliative care drugs within a matter of days. Next slide. Uh, the role of the tier assignment committee is to closely look at drugs that have been identified as potentially having a significant impact on health if, if in short supply and they're designated as a tier three if there's a clear shortage of ingredients or alternatives. And once drugs are listed as tier three, which was the case for injectable mosinal and phenobar, this starts a whole cascade of events with significant resources by the government directed at procuring supply as soon as possible. Next slide. When CSPCP initially got involved with the tier assignment committee, it was really obvious right from the beginning that there was this clear disconnect between the information that was being provided to Health Canada by the manufacturers and the information regarding availability and reserves and what we were experiencing at the ground. So there was this huge disconnect in the information that Health Canada was using to, to make decisions around drugs. So uh, this really busy slide is supposed to demonstrate to you the effort and the detail that Health Canada went into to try and figure out why this disconnect might be and to assist us with some of the drug shortage issues that we were experiencing. Essentially, manufacturers were informing Health Canada that they had lots of units in stock and that they were bringing in some additional shipments, you know, within the next few days to weeks. And there was no issues reported by purchaser, purchasers, and yet we were experiencing shortages at the bedside. There were several of these meetings that Health Canada organized, and since the first, first one in May, and I have to say, I think a big reason why some of the shortage issues were resolved were as a result of these really um, important meetings. Next slide. So you might decide that in addition to looking into ways of increasing the supply of drugs available, so reducing use with alternatives, you may have some ideas for conserving what supply you do have. Unfortunately, there are some regulations around the use of drugs that can work against some of these um, suggestions. CSPCP about a year ago tried to engage the pharmacy regulatory authorities to look at means of conserving current drug supply. So for example, we, we asked if we could reuse unused medications, which we're currently not allowed to, and then extend the beyond use date for certain medications, particularly those that we use within pre-drawn syringes. Needless to say, we weren't successful, but we thought when COVID happened, we, we thought we might, you know, have another shot at it and we'd try it again. This work is still ongoing, um, but there's certainly um, really early beginning stages which make me really, really hopeful that there's um, a much better coordinated effort nationally between various regions, and you'll certainly hear a lot more about it in Dr. Sol's segment. Next slide. So currently the tier assignment committee is, is kind of refocused its, its, um, its work. Given the significant resources that are involved with assigning a drug to tier three status, currently Health Canada is focused on delisting where appropriate, given the kind of quiet um, period that we're in right now. And I also want to stop and just um, give a big shout out and thanks to Kim Taylor at CSBCP because she's done significant work with advocating for us on this issue on our behalf nationally. Uh, Kim and I are going to continue to work with Health Canada to provide them with information as the pandemic evolves. Next slide. But here are some suggestions where you can get involved. Um, Please let us know if you're experiencing issues with drug availability in your area, get in touch with CSPCP. 
don't assume that we already know because some issues are really specific to regions and not necessarily um, the same issues throughout the country. And if, if CSPCP is not aware of any drug shortage issues, you can bet your bottom dollar that Health Canada certainly won't be. So consider reflecting on some of these points, you know, being vigilant about, you know, making sure that you understand what the issues are in your area. And, you know, this may be the calm before the storm. So perhaps a perfect time to think about some strategies. And you'll certainly hear some more ideas shortly around um, some regional suggestions and ways to get to be more informed about what's happening by both Dr. Souls and Mr. Von Krosink. Thank you. Charlie, would you like me to take some questions now or go straight to Bob? Uh, thanks, Abru. Um, just had a minor computer glitch for a moment there. Um, uh, we don't have any specific questions uh, yet on the Q&A, and this is just a reminder that as the presentations are ongoing, please go ahead and uh, type in your questions using the Q&A uh, function on Zoom. So uh, we will then move forward to uh, Dr. Bob Sauls. Thanks, Abru. Thanks, Abru, and thanks, Charlie. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about how we've approached this in Ontario. and. Uh, Certainly in, in April or so, we started to become aware that while there was lots of discussion about the shortages in critical care settings in hospital, there wasn't enough discussion about the risk to the drug supply in the community, particularly for palliative care patients. Uh, so we did some uh, initial work, the Ontario Palliative Care Network and the OMA and Ontario Health, but that led to the formation of um, this working group, Community Drug Shortages Working Group that was has been sponsored both by the Ministry of Health in Ontario and uh, Ontario Health. And our initial membership, um, is, as you see there, the, the Ontario um, is now has five uh, regions. And so five of the clinical VPs were represented as well as two physicians, uh, home and community care in the ministry. Uh, you'll note that we are missing a pharmacist, although that's on our list um, as yet. We initially meet, met weekly, but are now down to a meeting uh, bi-weekly. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, these are the areas that we really have focused on. It's, it's first of all, identifying the drugs and, and the alternates, as well as conservation strategies. And I'll add a few more words about supply and distribution. And then talking a bit about, uh, that Ebu referred to is about how do we communicate around this locally and regionally? and then a few thoughts about data collection. And then you go to the next slide. So our, our first piece of work really was around identifying what are the um, key drugs, uh, what are the alternatives that we can think about in, in um, situations of shortages, and then what are the, um, uh, the conservation strategies, both with specific drugs or drug classes, but also more generally. So this was a piece of work that we did um, within the working group, but also including the broad Ontario Palliative Care Network, the OMA section of palliative medicine, as well as some of the academic centers. And the link to that uh, document and report is, uh, is on the slide there, uh, which is fairly comprehensive. Um, some of the other issues, of course, and, and Andrew referred to the policy and regulatory issues that are of concern, uh, particularly if we are faced with shortages. And we've particularly been interested in the issue about reuse um, of medications. And, and our goal as a working group is to really follow the lead of the um, Canadian Society uh, on this and, and to participate where we can and to certainly advocate for some changes. The, the other um, thing that I've just put on here, because I think it's of interest to this discussion, is a recent um, uh, framework that was published on the website of the um, Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto, which specifically addresses the issues, the ethical issues around drug shortages uh, during the pandemic. In, in particular, it does address issues like, you know, some of these regulatory issues and how should we approach some of those regulatory issues uh, during um, a short potential shortage. 
The other thing that we have, are just embarking on is a look at uh, an area that we had some concern about, which was the use of symptom response kits. And let me go to the next slide. So certainly in Ontario, symptom response kits, which are kits which contain a small quantity of medication that are, that are for use in uh, you know, emerging or worsening symptoms um, and um, that can get by until a, a um, regular supply of medications available. So these are widely used across Ontario and I assume across uh, the country. Um, but of course the concern is that there is significant potential for wastage and this whole issue about reuse. So any unused medications in these kits is currently uh, destroyed. Um, and we have questions about, you know, how soon are they being distributed? What quantities? Um, one of the things that we have seen already and, and um, is that across Ontario, quite a number of kits were already modified um, in the early portion of the pandemic to reduce the, the amounts of medication and sometimes the actual specific medications contained. Where we are right now is we've collected samples of 16 um, symptom response kits from, on from around uh, the province. Um, and we've got one from each of the 14 regions uh, and a couple of extras. Uh, each of these kits is available throughout that particular region. Uh, what we also know is that, for example, in one region, there were six different kits being used in that particular region. And we suspect that that's true in many areas of the province. So what we've done is, is do a preliminary review of what's in the kits, what are the indications, what are the quantities of medications that are in these kits, and how much variation. And I think the questions that we will be asking is, is there a need for standardization of kits? Um, and would standardization lead to better conservation, or as one of our working group members said, better stewardship of our drug supply? Uh, would standardization lead to um, just better quality overall in the use of these kits? One of the areas I can tell you right off right away is one of the areas of the largest variation is how the issues of neuropsychiatric symptoms are um, approached with kits in terms of how these symptoms are defined, which drugs to use, what doses to use. That what I would say is probably the greatest variation that we've seen so far. So this is a process we're just embarking on to determine what the role for this is in terms of, um, of drug conservation. Um, the other question that we were talking about and thinking about is about just-in-time delivery. So are there uh, um, situations where we can delay delivery of these medications until they're actually needed or find alternative ways of, of delivery? We, we recognize right away that in rural and remote areas of the, of the province that that probably is not feasible at all. Um, but we're looking at whether there can be a variety of ways of, of drug delivery that would contribute um, uh, to um, conservation. So we go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, everyone has, has talked about, you know, the issue about the uh, tier three assignment process and, and from an Ontario point of view, what we're doing is, is simply you know, maintaining contact with that process, participating and contributing to it where it's appropriate. Um, and as Ebru also said, that not all the supply, not all the shortage issues are um, at a federal supply level, that some of them may be local or regional. And we've already discovered that, that there may be distribution issues. And so what we've done, uh, at least initially, is established, in essence, what we hope will be an early warning system where um, the five clinical VPs uh, are prepared to hear directly from prescribers, whether it be a physician or a nurse practitioner, if they are faced with a shortage in their community. Um, and we've already seen this activated a couple of times where the, the issue was local and they were able to arrange in real time for an adequate supply. And so we've distributed that contact information around the province through our network and through the um, Ontario Medical Association uh, as well. Um, 
And then the other issue we've talked about is what I would call, and part of this early warning system is, is really about uh, community level reporting. So in Ontario, there are a small number of larger pharmacies that are contracted to home and community care or home care uh, to supply uh, parenteral medications um, in the community. And in fact, for home care um, services, these pharmacies would supply the vast majority of the medications used or the ones that face a risk. And so what we've talked about is whether we can develop some type of regular reporting mechanism for these pharmacies so that we actually are able to get a handle on use, utilization and, um, and emerging um, shortages. I think right now what we've already realized is we have very little data on current utilization. And particularly when we started looking at symptom response kits, we have very little information about how much drug and what kind of quantities are going out there into the community. Um, so I think that having better data um, on utilization, having a, a regular reporting mechanism where, again, not in addition to prescribers, that we have that other um, level of reporting that we can identify um, shortages early. And then finally, I think as well, having this kind of data at a community level will allow us to better be able to project uh, what the need will be based on utilization patterns, but also on emerging um, increases in utilization. It may also allow us to be ready to trigger automatic substitution, for example, if we see shortages emerging uh, for particular drugs. And I think that's my last slide. Thanks, Bob. We do have a question uh, regarding symptom response kits. Yes. Uh, does nurses going into the home have access to these or only doctors? Uh, so the, it's, it's, in fact, the interesting thing is it's, it will both have, have access, but the reality is it's nurses that are utilizing it. So these kits are in place for nurses who go into the home, uh, face with a patient with a worsening symptom or a new symptom, and can make use of the medications in those kits um, um, right away. So it's nurses that are using it predominantly. And I know that um, from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction across Canada, there are differences and, um, and variability in terms of symptom response kits. Mm -hmm. um, in British Columbia, for example, Fraser Health has uh, palliative uh, kits as well, and physicians prescribe them. But it is, I agree with you, uh, same as Ontario, it's the nurses who actually uh, access them and draw out the medications. Uh, in Alberta, where I work, we actually do not have symptom response kits, and uh, it's been a point of discussion provincially, but um, a lot of bureaucratic pieces uh, to play out there. Um, a anonymous attendee is suggesting, could we not provide palliative kits where the compartments are zip tied so that the compartments which are still zip tied could be reused? This would be similar to how crush carts are stocked in a hospital. That's, that's interesting because those are exactly the kinds of um discussions that we've been having about whether, you know, uh, you can um, deliver kits in such a way that can validate that this drug was never used or touched and that, uh, that would allow for reuse. But again, that's going to come back to some national regulatory um, uh, bodies before we're actually able to do that. Right. And, and again, from a regulatory point of view, uh, a comment in the chat box indicating some community pharmacies shorting all drugs to 30 day supply. Is there not a standard list to determine those required to be shorted? Uh, when you say shorted, what, what does that mean exactly? I have a feeling they mean um, a more judicious um, uh, dispensing. Oh, so, so instead of dispensing. Yeah. yeah, instead of dispensing months at a time, they only dispense X number of days worth. Yes, and I think you know when I look again when I've looked at the the sampling of kits that we have in Ontario, um, particularly with the modifications that have been made during the pandemic, there are very few kits that are um, containing large volumes of medications anymore. Uh, these kits are really uh, going to get people only through 12 or 24 hours. 
And, and then the understanding is that the nurse needs to make contact with a prescriber to get an ongoing supply of medication. So that kit is really intended to only cover for a short period of time. And after that short period of time with prescribing, that's when the other considerations in terms of judicious dispensing from pharmacies, just-in-time deliveries, yes. and other strategies will come into play. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Um, all right, there are more questions, but I think we can save them at the end uh, for the sake of making sure that Marcus has adequate time to do his presentation. So for now, we're gonna turn it over to Marcus. Thank you, Paul, uh, Bob. Thank you, Charlie. Um, in our clinic, we took a sort of a two-pronged approach to try and both identify current shortages, but also try to get ahead a little bit of what was coming up down, or what was coming at us down the pipeline with regards to medication shortages. And the two-pronged approach kind of involved uh, myself as a pharmacist, checking with some of my colleagues in provincial drug distribution, and also with um, uh, looking at online resources. The other part, of course, was uh, one of our palliative care physicians, the Dr. Katrina Aparicio, would contact on more or less a weekly basis some of her, the pharmacies she was dealing with in the community to get an update on uh, any uh, current shortages. So I'm first going to discuss some of the online resources I use and their strengths and limitations. Um, Drug Shortages Canada uh, is, uh, was mandated, I believe, in some, uh, something like 2016 uh, by Canada for manufacturers to provide information with regards to ongoing shortages, uh, discontinuations of medications, and anticipated shortages. And it provides basically a searchable database that people can use to uh, see uh, uh, current shortages of particular medication, and they also provide a daily update on any current or pending shortages. Um, it has some strengths. Uh, it it's a reasonably good resource to use. It uh, provides a search uh, tool um, and lists um, uh, medications that, of course, are going to be shorted or if the resolved or if the shortage has been resolved. Um, it also provides rationale for why uh, medication is being sorted and um, again gives an estimated date of when things will be returning to market. My preference, however, is to use another resource. This next slide, please. Uh, which is a website uh, with regards to uh, nationally, the uh, availability of medication nationally um, developed by a medical student at the time and now currently I believe a resident in first year psychiatry in Ontario, uh, Dr. John Tipperton. Uh, the nice thing about this is it uh, provides both summary data, um, uh, which as you can see by the figure on the left, uh, shows a steady increase in drug shortages from 2019 to 2020 and the peak occurring I think uh, it was uh, April 19th of this year, so five days, or four or five days after the previous Pallium seminar on drug shortages, uh, which peaked out at around nine, over 1,900 uh, shorted medications. Since that time, you can see the uh, number of shorted medications has declined, but this can also include this, not just medications returning to uh, availability, but also can include discontinued medications. The figure on the right, I'll just briefly discuss, are some of the uh, rationale provided by uh, the manufacturers with regards to why the medications are currently shorted. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the advantage of this uh, is, uh, one of the advantages of this uh, uh, particular uh, website is that uh, Dr. Pippeton has uh, made the code freely available. So it is uh, open source programming in R. And uh, recently he updated it to include uh, medications identified by their ATC code, which are relative for use in anesthesiology, anesthesia. Um, in the, uh, on the horizontal axis, he basically has the timeline. On the uh, vertical axis, he includes uh, the number of products of this particular type uh, that are available. Uh, so if we look at fentanyl in particular, that is fentanyl 50 um, micrograms per mil concentration. That is um, uh, 
those are the uh, five uh, actively marketed products in Canada. And we can see that even before COVID-19, uh, which uh, is indicated the first Canadian patient is the black line on the left around February. And the first the red line indicates the first COVID death. Um, but we can see even before that, uh, the onset of COVID in Canada, that there were drug, ongoing drug shortages in medications, uh, relative anesthesia, uh, but also uh, pertinent to um, uh, palliative care. Uh, the one thing about uh, having the uh, source code freely available is that uh, for those who can, they can go in and modify it to focus on medications relevant to your specific, specific specialty, whether that be palliative care or uh, be that psychiatry or cardiology or whatever. And uh, next slide, please. In addition to that, uh, John has also put in a fairly powerful search tool to look at current drug shortages. Again, it doesn't have to be an actual shortage. It can be something that's anticipated and included in uh, sort of the summary data. He includes the uh, dura estimated duration um, uh, that the shortage will occur. So for example, we see Nazaman from Sanofi, third line down. Uh, it's anticipated shortage in, um, in August but it only is expected to last for a duration of 11 days. So that may not uh, have a significant impact on um, uh, uh, local community uh, availability. Um, again, the strength of this, uh, as with the other site, is that it gives you some idea of potential shortages in the future. But the downside is that, uh, as discussed by my uh, previous speakers, and also I discussed again at the previous webinar in April, is that it doesn't always reflect what's seen on the ground locally. Uh, next slide, please. Provincially, we have um, our uh, government supplies us, uh, provincial government uh, has a listing of, of uh, medications that are currently either shorted or unavailable and provides, uh, uh, we'll also uh, provides information of alternatives that are available with the, basically the same drug, uh, same strength, uh, that will be covered by the provincial drug plan. Uh, for example, we have fentanyl and glycopyrrolate, both Sandoz products currently on allocation in BC, uh, but are available, um, uh, but other brands uh, are, are readily available at the moment. Uh, stepping down to the next two items, the hydromorphone HP20 and HP10, um, there we have uh, the 10 was recently returned to market, um, but unfortunately, well, as of the end of June, um, according to national uh, data, but uh, it's still on allocation locally. And again, there's a discrepancy with even what we see provincial, what is reported provincially, uh, with what we find locally, because the pharmacy I contacted recently uh, does not have, it only has the 10 on allocation and does not have access to the 20, even though. Uh, nationally, there's no reported of, reporting of any shortage of the 20 mg per mil uh, hydromorphone from Sandoz. Um, so uh, one of the pros of this particular uh, site is that they actually provide you with an alternative if one is available and, it, uh, and, uh, and it's covered by our uh, provincial drug program. Next slide, please. So the other resources that I used were some of the pharmacy managers in particular, the our provincial group that uh, provides uh, medication for the, the, pro the BC cancer across the province. Um, sometimes they're given uh, a little bit of a, more of a heads up uh, pending shortages. Um, the downside is that often shortages, again, we were, that we were experiencing in community, they, they had no notice of because they're able to maintain supply through their uh, uh, distribution networks and reallocate medications as needed. And then it was my colleague, uh, uh, Katrina Abruzio, who was contacting her local pharmacies uh, to find what was actually available and in stock. And again, as mentioned by my colleagues, this often was not reflected in some of the national shortage data. Um, the pro, I guess, of this is you actually find out um, what is shorted and what's available locally. The con is that, you know, this is very time consuming, 
and involves um, uh, a lot of food. It just takes up a lot of time, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And then a lot of, again, a lot of the pharmacies may bring in extra stock, but then they try to keep that sometimes for their regular clients. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, um, the national information, it can be helpful uh, in predicting shortages, but it doesn't necessarily reflect what's available on the ground uh, at your local uh, pharmacy. Um, there is that one tool by uh, Dr. Pippeton, his website could be modified to again uh, look for uh, pending changes and current shortages with regards to specific medications for say palliative care or cardiology. Um, but again, uh, it doesn't always reflect what's seen on the ground and provincially we have the our local uh, drug shortages list, but again, it's not 100% consistent uh, with what's found uh, at this community pharmacy level. And this may somehow reflect the voluntary nature of the uh, reporting. So it, uh, that list is maintained by pharmacies calling in uh, to the province and reporting uh, shortages, which they then verify with uh, wholesalers. Uh, the one in terms of electronic data, the one piece I think that's missing from all of this is uh, the local distributors and local uh, wholesalers uh, somehow getting access to local inventory so that that can be integrated uh, and uh, used to assess uh, local availability of palliative and other medications. That's kind of me done. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, there are, have been several uh, questions brought up in the Q&A section with regards to symptom response kits. Um, there was a, a comment about um, dispensing of either medications for medical assistance in dying. And uh, there is similarity between the comments that even medications that have been dispensed uh, but uh, have not been opened or used are unfortunately still being discarded and this is uh, with regards to the symptom response kits, as well as medications that are not used uh, for medical assistance in dying. I wonder if any of our panelists have uh, any thoughts or responses to those concerns. Um, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, I think, I think this is a, a, a significant issue in terms of, of drug conservation. Um, um, and I was interested to hear the response about that there, in, in some instances, two sets of drugs uh, issued or dispensed for um, made. Um, again, this is, a, is an important regulatory issue. It, it seems to me that um, there should be mechanisms that would allow us to verify the safety of return drugs. Um, in such a way that we could actually conserve those drugs that are not being used. We also obviously have to build in the mechanisms uh, for, um, you know, at the time or after death, how are those drugs returned? What's the mechanism and the process for return of drugs? So there's, there's a number of features to that uh, that systems need to be put in place to do that. But I, I, it is always concerned. This is a concern even before the pandemic. Um, that I think we need to find some ways to do that and to address the regulatory issues. Ebru, I wondered if, if you wanted to speak a little bit about some of our efforts uh, from the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians and, uh, and the letters that we've written to the, the provincial, uh, provincial authorities. Yeah, thanks Charlie. Um, I think what really complicates everything is that some of these regulations are mandated regionally. So, you know, despite the fact that nationally there's this association that provides a blueprint or a framework for the various regions to work from, it's really up to the regions to decide how they're going to do things in their own area. So that makes it sometimes very challenging to, to be able to collaborate and work together on finding ways to, to move things forward. Essentially, when we try to engage with NAPRA, the National, National Association, um, we didn't get very far at all, despite the fact that we were in the midst of COVID and clearly they were aware that there were significant drug shortage issues as a result of an increase in demand. 
they didn't seem to have the same concerns as us regarding any changes that would be necessary. In fact, they told us that the next time that, that potentially this national framework could be re-looked at would be in a, in a number of years time. Clearly not going to be helpful for us. And that's when we really thought maybe we can, you know, look at working with the regional authorities instead. Perhaps we'll have better success that way. And hopefully, you know, in the next uh, few months, hopefully we will be able to succeed in making some really important changes. And certainly if there's already precedent around some drug conservation um, strategies, then we can use that to our advantage to make changes within our areas. Thank you, Abru. Um, and I think we are still seeing significant changes uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, province to province. And I, this is a question to um, all three panelists. Uh, two are from Ontario and one from BC. Um, I, I, in my mind, I think we should be working um, locally and advocating to our own uh, colleges and, and governing bodies and then um, escalating the issue provincially and then maybe uh, together escalating the issue nationally. What are some of your thoughts in terms of the advocacy work that, um, that those people on the call today uh, may be able to do? Charlie, I don't think I could have put it in a better way myself. I think you've summarized it in such an eloquent way in terms of the advocacy local, locally, regionally, and then potentially nationally. Yes, yeah, so I, would, I, I would agree. Uh, and I think, um, you know what, I, I guess the other piece that I, I think in terms of that whole issue of advocacy is uh, on the one hand, and I think, for example, um, I never, I talked about uh, reaching out to the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians if faced with some of these issues. I also think, you know, we probably have people on the uh, on the webinar from different or who um, uh, are connected to different organizations, professional organizations. And um, I do I have a belief that uh, part of advocating around these sorts of things uh, will go better when we have coalitions of organizations that are saying the same thing. So I think, um, um, you know, and, and so I think, for example, the OPC Ontario Palliative Care Network will be uh, certainly contributing to that, the OMA section of palliative medicine. I think uh, so the nurse practitioners uh, organizations, I think making use of your professional organizations uh, to do this or to help advocate for this, I think is, is helpful. Um, I think the other piece that I just wanted to add to this as well is one of the things that concerns me about some of the regulations is, and I've mentioned this in some of our previous conversations, is around what evidence there is that these regulations are based on. Mm -hmm. And I think the other sort of pathway that I think may be valuable is actually to examine what that evidence is and to be able to challenge some of that evidence if it's appropriate. Thank you, Bob. Um, the uh, other consideration would be from a protocol or procedural point of view, um, rather than the regulatory point of view. And um, there are some comments in the question and answer uh, box regarding uh, pharmacies or uh, potential uh, local jurisdictions requiring X amount of medications being dispensed for the safety of the, the patient and safety of the procedure. Um, and oftentimes these medications not being used. Um, so perhaps there is some evidence that we can look into for that. Uh, I wonder if any of you have some thoughts with regards to the policy end. Um, I guess what I could say then, I guess what, thinking about uh, the symptom response kits in particular, um, I, I think part of our goal in Ontario um, is to, uh, with our look at symptom response kits, is to uh, draw upon a broad clinical community uh, to, in fact, inform that policy. Um, and, and again, because this is linked to Ontario Health, uh, and, and if we use this broad-based uh, clinical um, 
community to inform what might be policy recommendations, I actually believe we would make some headway uh, there. Marcus, any thoughts about that from the BC perspective? Uh, well, Marcus, I think you've just put yourself oh, on mute. Sorry. Uh, no, nothing off the top of my head, sorry. I think we have an advantage here in Alberta, considering we are one health authority across the entire province. So there are significant efforts underway in terms of collaboration between the five different uh, health zones here in Alberta. And, and again, I imagine that there are going to be differences across the country, province to province, and, and how each uh, province is, uh, is administratively structured. Um, maybe a little more chaotic in Ontario with all the various lens compared to a uh, province like Alberta where there's only one health authority. I think, Charlie, of, yeah, Charlie ahead, I just I wanted to, to emphasize um, the point that Bob made around, you know, having in, um, interdisciplinary kind of lens when we're approaching some of these issues because I think Sometimes, you know, when as physician groups, when we're constantly talking about, you know, a particular issue, I think what makes our case so much stronger is to include our interdisciplinary colleagues, not to not forget that we can draw from their experiences and the wealth of their knowledge to essentially move forward on some of these issues. So, um, you know, I'm really glad that Marcus is here and to emphasize the point that, you know, sometimes reaching out to our colleagues is sometimes the best thing that we can do at, you know, whatever level that we're looking at this. Yes, thank you, Avru. And that um, answers one of the comments uh, or questions in the uh, question and answer was how has the interdisciplinary interprofessional collaboration uh, been for the medication shortage and palliative care and um, Ebru you've alluded to how important interdisciplinary and interprofessional uh, care and, and approach is to palliative care and and I think the way that we deliver the care from a uh, interdisciplinary way is how we can potentially tackle this issue as well as to go, uh, is to again collaborate. Um, any other thoughts about how interdisciplinary work has been going when it comes to this particular issue? I mean, I, the, my my only the, the example I can use is is that uh, the pieces of work that we've done in Ontario. We've intentionally made use of our um, both our clinical advisory councils through the Ontario Palliative Care Network, as well as the regional palliative care network. So there's 14 of those, and those are interdisciplinary uh, groups. Uh, so they're both physicians and non-physicians um, who um, have been part of providing the feedback as we've developed the the uh, for example the the initial. Um, document on uh, drugs and conservation strategies, as well as when we do the symptom re um, response kit, we'll make use of that same group. So, so we have a ready-made network to do that uh, and to get that kind of feedback. Great. Um, again, lots of interest about the symptom response kits um, or palliative kits as they are known in other areas. Um, there is one comment about um, proper storage for these medications in these kits, um, winter season versus summer, hot temperature. Um, any comments uh, from our panelists about that? Uh, it seems to be a, a lot of times that the discussion around returning medication seems to revolve around how the medication was stored when it's away from the pharmacy. Um, and that seems to be a lot of what, or some of what's behind returning even if you seal the medications, there's some concern. But in many industries, the food industry and other industries, they have temperature monitoring devices that are relatively inexpensive. And if, you know, if the medication were to be returned sealed with a temperature monitoring device, then there should be, I wouldn't say no objection, but there should be less objection with regards to uh, the stability of the medication and temperature exposure. A wonderful suggestion, uh, Marcus. And, and again, it demonstrates how we not only need to work interdisciplinary within healthcare, we need to look at other uh, fields 
um, in terms of how they're doing things and, and learn from each other, in this case, uh, the food industry. Um, other I questions think, regarding, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rabru. Charlie, I was just gonna say that something that might at first glance seem so simple can often be really, really complicated. And sometimes it's definitely worth looking at some of the policies we have because by looking and examining them, it might be clear to us that, you know, some are really quite outdated and worth re-examining with regards to, you know, any information that we have that's newer or more um, appropriate based on the situation that we're in. Yes. Um, another comment is uh, the uh, consideration that medications uh, need to be removed uh, promptly uh, from the home after a patient's death as there may be actually possibility of increased risk of uh, inappropriate use or, or diversion, or maybe even suicide by family members. And, um, and certainly that's a very valid consideration. Mm -hmm. I wonder if any of our panelists have any uh, comments with regards to that particular uh, statement. Um. You know, my thought there is, and again, just more on, on, based on my experience, is that there's the medications and the symptom. If that is a risk in a particular um, family, um, the medications and the symptom response kits would be one risk, but then all the other medications in the house. Oh, I think Charlie's lost his... Oh, I'm back now. And, and other people may have uh, lost some sound temporarily, actually, as well. Um, so it looks like our, um, our time is uh, coming to an end. Um, I, I, there is a sense from the question and answer um, box that um, ongoing um, collective work, um, collaborative work on a provincial and national um, scene would be useful. And there is uh, one final question about, is there a national pharma program that would benefit or impact drug shortages? And, and I think the answer, if I may speak on behalf of the panelists, it's that it's more of a collaboration rather than a program. Um, there's already a national um, uh, kind of governing body for the pharmacists, and then that's NAPRA. Um, and I think we can continue to work collectively and collaboratively as a national um, uh, group like Pallium and the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians to work together. Any additional thoughts in terms of how we can uh, continue to collaborate? And then we'll um, hand it over to Jeff to wrap up. One final thought about how we can um, work together. Ebru, from a CSPCP point of view, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, sorry, I think I, I thought I'd lost um, connectivity, but I'm on. Um, for, really, from my point of view, I think it's, again, recognizing that um, despite the fact that sometimes it can feel like an uphill struggle, and we're all extremely busy, particularly in the midst of a pandemic, I think it's just... Um, uh, it can be easy to feel overwhelmed. I think just, you know, whatever we can do to, to put in the work now, I think will pay dividends down the road, one. And, and just remembering, like, um, I really think that interdisciplinary approach might be the key. I think NAPRA and the regional authorities are probably going to pay more attention to their own members than to a physician group. So just thinking about it in that way, I think maybe might be um, uh, an approach that we can take moving forward. Great. Thank you for that, Ebru. And I'll hand it back over to Jeff for a final minute. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks, Charlie. And listen, on behalf of Pallium, I just I want to thank our esteemed panelists uh, for the time that they've invested in making this webinar happen. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in terms of their slides and the content and the collaboration. And uh, I really think we've we've seen some some really good dialogue, the rich dialogue that has ensued. So very appreciative um, panelists and moderator for, for everything you shared with us today. And, and a big thanks to all our participants for taking time out of your schedule to attend this webinar. Thank you for your questions and comments. Thank you to the team at Pallium, Stephanie Ferris and Brady Reardon uh, behind the scenes, making this happen from a technical perspective. Um, following the conclusion of this uh, webinar, you'll be sent an email with a link to provide feedback on today's session. I certainly encourage all of you to provide your feedback uh, so we can improve these webinars going forward. Uh, and again, a big thank you to all involved. I wish everyone a lovely evening uh, or morning or afternoon, depending where you are. And uh, I wish you all the very best. Thank you.